Okay, guys. We're going to get going if you're ready. The official piece of, uh, you know, usual official BS, uh, we will close the store at 8. You need to make any purchases by then. We won't throw you out. Everyone will get their books signed. We'll all have fun. I don't promise cupcakes, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got, I just want to mention really briefly before we go on, I've got a bunch of events coming up next time, uh, next week or next month, so I want to just rattle them off in a hurry. Ted Kuzmaka, local author, will be here for his new book on the 31st. Uh, we're going to have the official party for Stories for Chip, which is over there because Nalo's in it, but we're going to have the Whoa. official party <laughs> with Timmy with Timmy and Eileen and Nisi on the 4th. So come back for that if you're not like from across the country. Uh, local authors Will McDermott and Scott James Magner will be on the 10th for their new books. We're going to launch Robin Hobbs' new book on the 11th. Uh, we managed to negotiate Charles Strauss coming. He's coming to town anyway, so he's got a little pre worldcon event. He has a new book in the laundry files. He'll be on the 13th. And um, the 25th, I'm not quite sure how we did this. So I'm going to be a psychopath at that point because we're probably going to have Richard Cadre at 6 and then Christopher Moore at 7. That should be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should just fuse them into one person. <laughs> anyway, uh, other than that, thank you for coming. I uh, just wanted to let Claire and Westy go over, so please welcome this year's chair, Vicki Saunders. of 2009 and now I'm the chair and I'm welcoming you to Nala's reading. Um, I'm really happy to see her again. She was my teacher in 2009 so it's great and uh, I do want to encourage you to remember that the books need to be bought a little before eight. We'd like to encourage everyone to buy books. Um, okay and there's one more reading. Corey Dr. Rose is a special reading and he's not to be confused with E.L. Dr. Rose who just died today. <laughs> Corey is still with us and he will be giving a reading and we're having it across the street at the University Temple United Methodist Church. There is admission for that reading and you can check it out on our website. It's $10 a ticket if you buy in advance, $12 at the door. He'll be discussing Electronic Frontiers with Frank Catalano of GeekWire and um, reading and signing too. And I must thank Clarion West's generous supporters including Amazon the National Endowment for the Arts, King County for Culture, the University Bookstore. Thank you, Dwayne. And many of you. So thanks, all of you who have donated to Clarion West. Um, and I know some of you are writing for the Clarion West Write-a-thon, and some are supporting the writers. The Write-a-thon's going on now. It's our biggest yearly fundraiser. You've probably heard this all before, but I'm just going to repeat it a little more. Um, we've created award-winning books and stories from the Write-a-thon, and if you want to learn more or contribute, go to our website. And now please welcome Neil Graham, our workshop director, who will tell you more about Nala. Hi. Most of you know Nala, but um, I'm going to just give you a brief biography. She was born in Jamaica, but has also lived in Trinidad, Guyana, and for many years in Canada. She is currently a professor of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside. She's the author of six novels, two short story collections, one of which is debuting today here, and a chapbook. She is also, edited the, uh, she's also the editor of numerous fiction anthologies and is about to start co-editing Lightspeed's People of Color Destroy Science Fiction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dalo Hopkinson's work has received honorable mention in Cuba's Casa de las Americas Literary Prize, as well as winning the Warner Aspect First Novel Award, the John W. Campbell Award, the Locus Award, the World Fantasy Award, the Norton Award, and here's where, to me, the award names start describing her work. The Gay Lactic Spectrum Award, the Sunburst Award for Canadian Literature of the Fantastic, which she's won twice, and the Aurora Award. Nella Hopkinson's work is rich and wild, as well as daring, dark, and playful. It deals with ancient connections and transformations, with healing, growing, and confrontation, with failure and with triumph. Her work immediately transports me into any world she's writing about, whether it's Toronto, the Caribbean, the future, or the past. It bursts with real human life. Yes, like a sunburst and like an aurora. It dazzles. 
please help me welcome Carlo Hawkinson. Thank you, Neil. Um, thank you, everyone from Clarion West. Thanks to the bookstore and to the amazing Duane who managed to get um, copies of my new short story collection before it's actually out. So <laughs> if you get it today, you're scooping everybody, including me. <laughs> I only have the ARC. Um, I'm going to watch the time. I'm going to try to watch the time to give you time to buy books. I figured what I'd do is read one short short and one longer short story. And I believe I've set it up so that... No, I thought it was one science fiction, one fantasy, but no, it's both fantasy. So this collection is called Falling in Love with Hominids. It is um, named in homage to a story by Cordwainer Smith um, about, he wrote a series of stories uh, in the Instrumentality series, I believe, um, that involved um, underclasses of people who were uplifted animals um, who ended up doing all the, the scut work in their community. And uh, the story that I'm thinking of is, I believe, called The Ballad of Lost Kamel. Yeah. She took the witch of the what she did. <laughs> but she fell in love with a hominid, so where is the witch of the what she did? <laughs> um, actually, this is science fiction. I start to forget. <laughs> <laughs> the story's called Men Sell Not Such in Any Town. Again, looking at... Um, Christina Rossetti's 19th century poem, Goblin Market, which is uh, simultaneously one of the most innocent and the most dirty poems I know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she intended the innocent part. <laughs> Blame the dirty all in my mind. <laughs> Did you hear? Rivner's created a new fruit. Oh, very dull. Her last piece was a fruit, too. Not like this one, Salope said. She sat me at the table, murmuring the evening benediction as she did so. She draped my long sleeves artfully against the arms of the chair in the first pattern of the benediction ritual. She took my hat and veil, hung them on the peg. She plucked the malachite pins from my hair one by one. She shook the dark springing mass free and refashioned it into a plait down my back. I endured as long as I could, then leaned back and stared up into her cool granite eyes. Tell me of Rivener's creation, I commanded her. She came around to my side. She slipped her fingertips into the pockets of her white apron and composed herself for the tale. She stood quite straight, as was proper. My blood quickened. Rivener's previous fruit, she said, only sang like a rainforest full of parrots, only enhanced the prescient abilities of those who ate it. This one is the pinnacle. She stopped, though she didn't need breath. I felt a single drop of sweat start its slow trickle between my breasts. The heavy silts were stifling. Stop dawdling, tell me. She caught her bottom lip between gleaming teeth. She came and draped my sleeves into the second pattern. This evening, she'd chosen the shapes of morning doves. I gritted my teeth. She continued, it is the color of early autumn, they say, and the scent lifting off its skin is a fine bouquet of virgin desire and dandy sweat with a top note of baby's breath. It fits in the palm, any palm. Its flesh is firm as a loving father's shoulder. She stopped to dab at my face with a cut work and then handkerchief from her pocket and I nearly screamed. She resumed, the fruit shucks off its own peel at a touch, revealing itself once only to its devourer. A northern dictator burst into tears at the first taste of its pulp on his lips and begged the forgiveness of his people. Poet and thrice cursed child of a damn poet. Her father too had played this game of stirring exalted cravings in me. I lifted my bodice away from my skin, fanned it to let air in. It wasn't enough. Salok squatted in her sturdy black shoes, square at heel and toe. This exposed her strong thighs, brought her face level with my bosom. I'm making you hungry, aren't I? Thirsty? <laughs> Bring me some water. No, no, wine. At once. She left the room, returned with a sleek glass pitcher and a glass on a silver tray. The golden liquid was cold and beaded the pitcher. Salope poured for me, tilted the glass to my lips. 
I tasted the wine. It was dry and dusty in my mouth. I turned my head away. What does Rivener call this wonder? I asked. The God under the tongue. Salok put the glass down on the table and took the appropriate step backwards. There are 117, limited edition, each one infused with her signature histamine. The one that makes the fingertips tingle? The very same. This heat, it distracted one, so I wish to purchase one of these marvelous fruit. To taste it? Of course to taste it. Bring me my meal. Instantly. She went, returned with a gold dish covered with a lid of sleekest bone. It had been fashioned from the pelvis of a whale, I knew this. She put the dish down, uncovered it. A fine steam rose from it. Here is your supper, enlightened. I picked up the golden spoon. Contact the, the auction house. Salope barely smiled. I already have. It's too late. All 117 of the god under the tongue are already spoken for. I slammed the spoon back down onto the table. Tell them I will pay. Command Rivner to make another, just, just one more. Salope looked down at the ground. When she returned her gaze to mine, she was serene. It's too late, enlightened. The Academy has decided. Rivner has been transmigrated to level sublime. She is beyond your reach. Machine. There is no need for insult, enlightened. Go away. Salope bowed, returned the spoon to my hand, and dissipated into black smoke. I preferred a pale rose mist, but Salope kept stubbornly reverting to black. It had been her father's favorite color. Her father had finally pushed me too far. I had ordered him to dissolve himself permanently from my aura. I had grieved for two voluptuous years, then sought everywhere for his like, nothing. Eventually, in desperation, I had his daughter created, perverse poet's child, how she could arouse the senses. I am Amakon Corazon, Junia Principia Delgado III, and I bent over my meal and wept luxurious tears into my green banana porridge. It was a perfect decoction, and now it would never satisfy me. Only the poet's daughter and her father before her ever saw me so transported. The room spoke with Salope's voice. Thank you, enlightened. I consider myself well paid for today's session. Please recommend my services to your acquaintances. I would. Oh, I would. <laughs> so that story happened when um, Nature Journal, which is a uh, referee journal of biology and nature, um, for a while was looking for science fiction shorts. Uh, I believe the length they wanted was around 800 words. Um, and the fiction editor, Henry G, was paying for them. Um, I didn't realize at the time that um, for scientists to have a piece in a nature journal, they had to pay, their department had to pay. So when I told my friend who was, um, uh, a scientist, a, bio, a biologist at um, the University of Toronto, I said, I just got paid to put a story in nature. He said, what? Come <laughs> on, tell me the story. What, what the hell happened there? Um, and so they were looking for science fiction stories, and I, 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 this is as close as I got to science fiction. Um, my partner, uh, when he read it, pointed out that it is in many ways a story of the uh, loneliness industry. It's a sex work story. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, right, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> this next one was published in um, an anthology by Kelly Link and Gavin Grant. Uh-oh, I should have done my homework. Monstrous something. Affections. Thank you. I love my community, all know so much more than I do. Um, <laughs> Monstrous Affections, which is a young adult anthology about stories about young people who have monsters as friends. Um, yeah, I think I'll just read it. It's called Left Foot Right. Oh, before I do, a lot of this is written in Trinidadian vernacular. Sometimes when I read like this to an audience that is not Caribbean, uh, I, I hear people sometimes talking about afterwards about my, my performance of the accent. Um, 
it's not a performance, it's my accent. <laughs> it's the closest one I have being a diasporic Canadian person, diasporic Caribbean person, diasporic person to um, one of the accents of the region where I was born. Oh, you have this in a size nine. Jenna puts the shiny red patent shoe down on the counter. Well, it used to be shiny. She's been wearing it everywhere, and now it's dulled by dust. It's the left side of a high heel pump, pointy-toed, with large, shiny, fake rhinestones decorating the toe box. Each stone is a different size and color in a different cheap plastic setting. The red veneer has stripped off the heel of the shoe. It curls up off the white plastic heel base in strips. Jenna's heart clenches. It's exactly the kind of tacky, blinged out accessory that Zuleika loves, loved to wear. The girl behind the counter is wearing a straw baseball cap, its peak pulled down low over her face. The girl asks in a puzzled voice, but don't you bought exactly the same shoes last week? And the week before that, thanks Jenna, and the one before that. I lost them, she replies. At least I lost the right side. She nearly chokes on the half truth. So I want to replace them. All around her, other salespeople help other customers. The people in the store zip past Jenna, half seen, half heard. This year's Soka Road March roars through the store's sound system. Last month, Jenna loved it. Now any happy music makes her vex. Jeez, what's the matter with you now, the girl says. Jenna startles guiltily. She risks a look at the shoe store girl's face. She hadn't really done so before. She's been avoiding eye contact with people lately, afraid that if anyone's two eyes make four with hers, the fury in hers will burn the heart out to the core of them. But the girl isn't looking at Jenna. With one hand, she is curling the peak of her cap to protect her eyes against the sun's glare through the store windows. Only her small, round mouth shows. She seems to be peering into the display on the cash register. She slaps the side of the cash register. Damn thing. It's like every time I touch it, the network goes down. Oh, says Jenna, it's not me you were talking to then. The girl laughs, a childlike sound like small dinner bells tinkling. <laughs> no, unless it has something the matter with you too. Is there? Jenna turns away, pretends to be checking out the rows of men's running shoes, each one more aerodynamically fantastical than the last. <laughs> like race cars. No, not me. About the shoes? Sure. The girl takes the pump from Jenna. Her fingertips are cool when they brush Jenna's hand. What a shame you can't replace just one side. Do you really wore this one down in just a week? You need both sides, left and right. The girl inspects the inside of the shoe in that mysterious way that people who sell shoes do. <laughs> you say you want a size nine, but you take more like an eight, right? How do you know that? I remember you from last time you were in the store. Feet is so important, you don't find? Jenna doesn't remember seeing the girl in the store before, but the details of her life have been a little hazy the past few weeks. Everything seems dusted with unreality. Her, standing in a shoe shop, doing something as ordinary as buying a pair of shoes. Her standing at all, instead of floundering. The shoe shop girl's body sinks lower and lower. Jenna is confused until the girl comes out from behind the counter. She's really short. She has been standing on something in order to reach the cash register. Her arms and legs are plump, foreshortened. The hems of her jeans are rolled up. Her body is pleasantly rotund. The girl glances at Jenna's feet. At, last, at least that's where Jenna thinks she's looking. Jenna's seeing the girl from above, so it's hard to tell. In addition to the straw cap, the girl's twisty black hair is in thousands of tiny plaits that keep falling over her face. She must have been looking at Jenna's feet because she says, yep, size eight, don't it? Jenna stares down at the top of the girl's head. She says, Yes, but the pumps run small. The girl is wearing cute yellow moccasins that look hand-sewn. She didn't get those at this discount shoe outlet. Her feet are tiny. The toe, boxes of her, the toe boxes of her moccasins sag a little. Her toes don't quite fill them up. Jenna curls her own toes under. Her feet feel unfamiliar in her plain white washikongs, the tennis shoes she used to wear so often before her world fell in. Now she only wears two sides of shoes when she needs to fake normal or when she needs to take the red pump off to show the people in the shoe store. The blisters on the sole of her right foot are uncomfortable cushions against the canvas lined foam inside the shoe. Although she'd scrubbed the right foot bottom before putting the washikong on, she hadn't been able to get all of the weeks of grounding dirt out. The heel of her left foot, imprisoned most of the time in the red high heel, has become a stranger to the ground. 
Going completely flat-footed like this makes the shortened tendons in her left ankle stretch and twang. The girl hands the shoe back to her and says, I'm going in the back to see if we have any more of these. She disappears amongst the high rows of shoe shelves. She walks jerkily with a strange rise and fall motion. Jenna sits on one of the benches in the middle of the store. She slips off her left side tennis shoe and slides her left foot back into the destroyed pump. The height of it makes her instep ache and her foot slides around a little in the too big shoe. When she'd borrowed Zuleika's pumps without asking, she'd only planned to wear them out to the club that one night. The discomfort of the red shoe feels needful and good. It will be even more so when she can remove the right side washcloth, feel dirt and hot asphalt and rocks with her bare right foot. She waits for the girl to bring the replacement pumps. The girl returns, hop draw, hop draw, carrying a shoebox. Jenna doesn't want to be in the shop, fully shod, a second longer. She takes the box from the girl, almost grabbing it. These are fine, she says, and stumps. Hop drop, hop drop, to the cash register. She starts taking money out of her purse. Behind her, the girl calls, you don't want to try them on first? Don't need to, Jenna replies. I know how they fit. The girl gets back behind the counter and clambers up onto whatever she'd been standing on. She sighs. <sighs> this job, she says to Jenna, so much standing on your feet all the time, I'm not used to it. Jenna isn't paying the girl a lot of attention. Instead, she's texting her father to come and get her. She doesn't drive at the moment. May never drive again. The girl rings up the purchase. Her plaits have fallen <coughs> into her eyes once more. When she leans forward to give Jenna her change, her breath smells like pepper shrimp. Jenna's tummy rumbles, but she knows she won't eat. Maybe some ginger tea. The smell of almost any food makes her stomach knot these past few weeks. The girl pats Jenna's hand and says something to her. Jenna can't hear it clearly over the sound of the, her grumbling stomach. Embarrassed, she mumbles an impatient thank you at the girl, grabs the shopping bag with the shoes in it, and quickly leaves the store. After the air-conditioned chill of the store, the tropical blast of the outdoors heat is like surfacing from the river depths to sweet, scorching air. She kicks off the single tennis shoe. She stuffs it into the shopping bag with a new pair of pumps. The girl had said, is Yoan Sinead? Jenna doesn't know anybody with those names. Daddy texts back that he'll meet her at the Savannah by the ice cream man. He means the ice cream truck that has been at the same side of the Savannah since Jenna and Zuleika were young. Jenna likes sour soap ice cream. Zuleika liked rum and raisin. One Sunday when they were both little, their parents had brought Jenna and Zuleika to the Savannah. Jenna had nagged Zuleika for a taste of her ice cream until Mummy ordered Zul Zuleika to let her try it. A sulking Zuleika gave Jenna her cone. Jenna tasted it, spat it out, and dropped the cone. <laughs> so Daddy made Jenna give Zuleika her ice cream, which made Jenna ball. But Zuleika wanted her rum and raisin. She pouted and threw Jenna's ice cream as far as she could. It landed in the hair of a lady that was walking in front of her. <laughs> Jenna was unhappy, mommy and daddy were unhappy, the lady was unhappy, and Zuleika was unhappy. Jenna remembers the odd satisfaction she had felt through her misery. Except that then, Zuleika wouldn't talk to her or play with her for the rest of the day. Jenna smiles. It probably hadn't helped that she had followed Zuleika around the whole rest of that day, nagging her for, for attention. Jenna turns off her phone so no one else can call her. Her boyfriend Clarence tried for a while, came to visit a couple of times after the accident, but Jenna wouldn't talk to him. She didn't dare open her mouth for fear of drowning him in screams that would start and never, ever stop. Clarence eventually gave up. The doctors say that Jenna is well enough to return to school. She doesn't know what she will say to Clarence when she sees him there. As Jenna is crossing the street, she walks with her bare right foot on tiptoe. That almost matches the height of the high heel on her left foot, so it isn't so obvious that one foot is bare. But she can't keep that up for long, not anymore. After more than a fortnight of walking with her right foot on tiptoe, the foot has rebelled. Her toes cramp painfully, so she lowers her bare heel to the ground. She steps in a patch of sun-melted tar, but she barely feels the burn. Her foot bottom has developed too much callus for it to bother her much. People in the street make wide berths around her in her tattered one side shoe. They figure she is homeless or mad or both. She doesn't care. She makes her way to the 300 acre savanna. 
Not too many people walking or jogging the footpath yet, not in the daytime heat. But the food trucks are in full swing, bending oyster cocktail, roast corn, palauri doubles. Jenna ducks past the ice cream man, man hoping he won't see her and ask how she's doing. He knows he knew Jenna and Zuleika well. He'd watch them grow up. The pui trees are in bloom. They carpet the grass with yellow and pink blossoms. Jenna steps over a cricket wicket, discarded on the ground, and goes around a bunch of navy uniformed schoolgirls liming on the grass under the trees. A couple of them are eating rotis. They all stop their chatting long enough to stare at her. When she passes them, they whoop with laughter. Jenna doesn't know how she will manage school next week. She finds a bench not too far from the ice cream man where she can see Daddy when he comes. She sits and puts the shoe bag on her lap. She clutches the folded top of it tightly. She doesn't put the new shoes on. She never has. They aren't for her. She was wearing the left side of Zuleika's shoes when she surfaced. She has to give Zuleika a good pair of the shoes in return for the ones she took without permission. For a few minutes, Jenna rests her aching feet. Then she realizes that the air is beginning to cool. The sun will be going down soon. Jenna texts her father again, tells him never mind that she will come home on her own later. He tries to insist. She refuses. Then she turns the phone off. It's better like this anyway. Her parents, they're doing their best, looking after Jenna, asking after her, doing their grieving in private. Some days Jenna can't bear the burden of their forgiveness. She can't take neither bus nor taxi half shot the way she is. She gets up off the bench, wincing at the separate pains in her feet. She starts walking, clump, thump, clump, thump, one shoe off and one shoe on. It's dark when she gets to the right place on the highway. The sight of the torn apart metal guardrail sets her blood boiling so till she nearly feels warm enough for the first time in almost a month. Anger is the only thing hotting her up nowadays. When are they going to fix it? She lets herself through the space between the twisted pieces of metal and starts clambering down the embankment. Below her, the, the river whispers and chuckles. A few times, she loses her footing in the pebbles and sparse scrub grass of the dry red earth of the embankment and slides a little way down. She could hold on to clumps of grass to try and stop her skid, but why? Instead, she digs in the heel of Zuleika's remaining pump. Above her, cars whoosh by along the highway. But the closer she gets to the tiny patch of wild between the highway and the river, the more the traffic sounds feel muffled, less important. The moonlight helps her to see her way, but she doesn't need it. She knows the route. Every rock, every hillock of grass. She has been here every night for a few weeks now, as soon as the bleeding stopped and the hospital discharged her. Tiny glowing dots of fireflies prick the darkness open here and there all around her. Jenna's skin pimples in the cool evening breeze. The sobbing river flows past, just ahead of her. At the shoreline, Jenna gets to her knees. Zuleika, she yells. She sits back on her heels in the chilly riverbank mud, clutching the shoe bag in her lap, and waits. The heel of the red shoe pokes into her backside, but the mud feels good on the blistered sole of the other, barefoot. Zuleika, nothing. I'm sorry about your fucking shoes, all right? Nothing. She gets the new shoes out of their box. She tosses them into the water. They sink. She waits. She's waiting for the frogs and the reeds to stop chirping, for the sucking pit of grief in her chest to fill in, for Zuleika to forgive her. When none of that happens, just like it hasn't happened every other time she's come down here, she sighs and stands up. The heel of the left shoe sinks down into the mud. She pulls it out with a sucking sound. The river isn't the only thing weeping. Someone is crying over there in the dark where the mangroves cluster thicker together. Jenna heads, hop drop, towards the sound. There are tiny footprints in the muddy soil. They lead away from the crying, towards the direction of the embankment. In the dark, Jenna can't make out how far they go. But she can tell where they came from, so she follows the footprints backwards. There's a child sitting on a big rock by the waterside. The child is the one crying. It is wearing a huge Panama hat to keep from burning in the moonshine? Jenna doesn't <coughs> laugh at her own joke. The child is wearing jeans rolled up at the ankles, a too big t-shirt. It has its legs tucked up and its chin on its knees, prop in sorrow. In the moonlight, Jenna can see the yellow moccasins on its tiny feet. It's a girl from the shoe store. When she gets near enough, Jenna says, what are you doing out here, something wrong? 
I was trying to catch crabs, the girl replies. I like them too bad. Jenna remembers the seafood smell on the girl's breath. Trying to catch them how? With my hands, no? You went wading in this water at night with nobody around? This water not good, says Jenna. It takes people, she doesn't say. Sure enough, now that she's closer, she can see that the girl is sopping wet. Water is running off her clothes and streaming down the sides of the rock. The girl replies, Mommy don't have time for me. I've been trying to catch my dinner myself, but the girl starts sobbing again. My feet hurt so much. All that standing in the shoe store all day. Every time I put my feet down, it's like I'm walking on nails. I keep flinching when I step and frightening off the crabs them. Poor thing. Something small releases inside Jenna like the easing of a stitch. She squishes through the mud and sits on the rock beside the girl. She puts the bag with the empty shoebox in it down on the rock. I know how it feels when your feet pain in you, she says. Whimpering, the girl leans closer to Jenna. The smell of seafood makes Jenna's tummy grumble again. Jenna thinks she could comfort the girl with a hug. She doesn't do it, though. Since last month, she doesn't have any business with comfort. But the girl won't stop crying, her shoulders jerking with the force of her sorrow. Unwillingly, Jenna asks, you want me to help you catch the crabs? The girl doesn't lift her Panama-hatted head, but her crying noise stops. You would do that for me? She asks, sounding so young. She's only a child. You would have to show me how, Jenna replies, and how old you are anyway. The girl says, you have to put your feet in the water, slow, slow and quiet, so the crabs don't know you're there. You have to stay crouched over, ready to grab them when they come up. Jenna doesn't want to put her feet back into the river that had swallowed her and Zuleika not too long ago. She still has nightmares of escaping through the open driver's side window, of her head feeling light from holding her breath in. Only in her dreams, Zuleika doesn't let go when she, when she grabs Jenna's right foot. Jenna whispers so the child won't hear her talking to, Z to Zuleika. I told you to undo your seat seatbelt, don't it? When we started sinking, I told you. You should have come with me, but all you did was scream. In Jenna's dreams, she isn't able to kick her leg free of Zuleika's panicked hold. In Jenna's dreams, river weed comes pouring out of Zuleika's hand and wraps itself around Jenna's right ankle and doesn't let go. In Jenna's dreams, she drowns with her sister. Every night, she drowns. But she's promised the shoe shop child, okay, says Jenna, just until your mommy comes. She briefly wonders why a little girl is working in a shoe store, why she's hunting for crabs alone down by the river at night, but she doesn't wander for too long. The world has become strange, and she is no longer part of it. I'm watching the time. I think I could go to a quarter two. Yeah, sure. Jenna takes off the mashed up left side shoe and puts it on the rock. She wiggles her toes. Night air slips through the spaces between them. It feels odd. She had put that shoe back on after Zuleika's funeral. She eases herself down off the rock. Now she's standing, both feet bare, on the river bank. Her feet are squishing up mud. The left foot sinks a little farther into the mud than the right one. In front of her, black as oil, the rolling river giggles. She can't do this. Jenna turns to walk back to solid land to leave the child here to wait alone for its mother. Don't be frightened, says the child. I'm not frightened, Jenna replies. She is, but not of the water. Truth to tell, she wants nothing more than to sink down into the river to join Zuleika. She wants it so badly, but she knows she can't. Can't make her parents lose two daughters to the river in less than a month. And she loves the sweet air. Heaven help her, but she loves it more than she loves her sister. Actually, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Greedy, but the trick is to leave them wanting more. <laughs> um, it's 7.38. Uh, probably have time for a couple questions, or how does this usually work? Do you buy the books and then come back, or that doesn't seem... Mm -mm. Okay. okay, so questions now then, if you have any. I stupefied you. <laughs> <laughs> such vivid imagery 
are there any of them that ever actually give like you like freakouts or nightmares later? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone that can remember doing that was uh, written at my clarion in 1995, where I, I had um, I was terrified I didn't have any writing in me, and um, we had Joe Haldeman the first week, and he's a lovely, lovely man. And we asked him about breaking that block, and he had some suggestions. And I wrote a story that um, I didn't exactly sleep that night. Um, <laughs> I kept having nightmares that things were coming through the window at me. And after I turned it in, so did my fellow students. <laughs> <laughs> I know at least one of them has probably never exactly forgiven me for this. <laughs> The weird thing is I don't think of myself as writing horror because horror scares me. But when I'm writing stuff like this, there's an odd humor to it for me. Others? Yes. As someone who sort of navigates the multiple genre roles and stuff, the world of, I don't know, literature and the mainstream, do you have any advice for how to navigate Ignore the roadblocks. Because <laughs> I don't, I'm not aware of myself navigating them. Um, I'm aware when people invite me to things that I don't expect to be invited to. But um, I think just write from your own vision and your own strength and put it out there and see what happens is, is what has worked the best for me. If I think, try to think about, you know, this is for this market and this is for that. Mm. I never know who's going to buy something, if at all, so <laughs> ignore them, just step over them. <laughs> um, if I'm remembering correctly, you've been involved with the science fiction collection at the university. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. So I'm at the <coughs> University of California, Riverside. started four years ago um, when someone decided to make me a professor. Um, <laughs> And it's a lovely thing, because I was literally starving before then. Um, University of California, Riverside has the largest collection of science fiction and fantasy that is open to the public. It's a huge archive called the Eaton Archive. And part of why I got hired, it also has its own creative writing department, so I'm not in English. I'm in creative writing, where it is expected I will teach science fiction and fantasy. I don't know any other job like that. Um, I'm part of a three faculty research cluster in science fiction and fantasy. And um, we do programming, we have reading groups, we bring in authors. University of California Riverside is 77%, now let, me, let me say this the way that the professor told me, it is 23% white. This was not the figure, the word I expected after the 23%. <laughs> so it, it's a wonderful place to be doing science fiction. And we recently got a big grant to do a year of programming into alternate and people of color futurisms. Yeah. So we'll be spending 2015, 2016 doing various programs. So check the, the website for um, the Science Fiction and Technoculture Studies program at UCR to see what's coming up because a lot of those events, if you're around, will be open to the public. Okay, I think I should stop now unless anyone has a brief and burning question. All right. How do you manage to be so That one's not brief. <laughs>
They used to make their own TV